Welcome to Green Road Church, a place of friendship. Do you guys know where you are? <laughs> Come on, we've done this. We've done this before. Welcome to Green Road Church, a place of friendship and faith. That's right, and sometimes food. Well, my name is Rick Pinkney, and I am the pastor of Green Road Church, and, and we welcome you here today. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us. Uh, if you are new, a guest, or a visitor, we do have welcome cards in the pews. And if you would like to get some more information about Green Road Church or connect with us, please fill one of these out and put it in the green basket that's uh, behind the sanctuary. Well, God has gathered us to worship him today. So I invite you to stand in body or spirit to hear these words from Psalm 33. Psalm 33 says, Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him 
our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Green Road Church, holy is the Lord and worthy of all our worship. new 
song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to Our holy God is the God who greets you this morning. Receive God's greeting, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I already had my caffeine. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, this morning I wanted to talk to you about a story that you probably are already familiar with, but maybe maybe you haven't heard. Hey, good morning. Good morning. There's more coming? Oh, wow, there's more coming. Wonderful. Come on down. All right. So today I want to talk to you about a story. Hey, come on down. Oh, yeah. Plenty of room. We got plenty of room up here. 
Good morning. Good morning. So this morning, I want to talk to you about a story that you've probably heard before, but, but we're just going to refresh it. What story do you think I'm going to tell? Exactly. The story of Noah and the ark. And for those of you who've heard this story, you know that, that humankind had become so bad, so wicked, that God decided he was going to send a flood to wipe out all living creatures on earth. But God found one man who was righteous and who loved God and who obeyed God, and his name was Noah. And God told Noah to build an ark. And an ark is really just a very large boat. And God told Noah that that boat, that ark, would be for Noah and his, oops, oh, that's right. I almost got my pictures mixed up. That, that ark would be for Noah and his wife, his three sons, and their wives, and exactly. He, he, he told Noah to, to, to gather, or rather, I think God sent the animals to him, but uh, two of every kind of animal, and he told them to get on the ark because there was a flood coming. And so Noah obeyed. He built the ark. His whole family got two of every kind of animal to go on the ark. And once they were all on the ark, God shut the door. And then God sent the rain. For 40 days and 40 nights, it rained, and God sent the flood waters, and every living creature on earth was destroyed. Very sad. Except for Noah and his family and all of those animals that he took on the ark. They were all safe on the ark. And then after 40 days and 40 nights, it stopped raining. And then after some time, God sent a powerful wind that dried up all the earth. And then finally, the ark came to rest on some mountains. And Noah and his family and all the animals were able to come out of the ark. And I was looking at this picture, and I'll tell you what, even, look at that. Even, what's that? What animal's right there? A skunk! A skunk! Look at that, I was looking at this picture, getting ready to tell the story to you, and it's like, wait a minute, he took skunks on? Yep, skunks too. Hey, God loves skunks too. Ooh, they stinky. Well, after they came out of the ark, Noah built an altar, and he sacrificed some animals on it as a way of saying thank you to God, telling God thank you for, for saving him and his family. Mikey? Actually, no, and I'm going to touch on that in my sermon. <laughs> so, so you'll be in here for the sermon, I think. Uh, uh, those, that's the... Uh, the animal that he's sacrificing. It's a lamb. But, but I, you'll hear in the sermon uh, why this, this didn't go extinct. But Noah, he, he sacrificed animals to thank God for saving him, and then God made a promise. And God promised that he would never, never destroy all life on earth by sending a flood. Never do that again. And as a sign of that promise, what's up here at the top of the page? That's right, a rainbow. At the, at the top of the page, you can see right up there, God put a rainbow in the sky as a sign of his promise that he would never destroy all life again. And that rainbow is a sign of God's mercy. It's a sign of hope. It's a sign of that life will go on because God loves us. Do you have another question? Exactly. By a flood, exactly. You're, well, I don't get into that in the sermon, but we'll talk about that another time. Man, you're, you're tracking. That's good. But that's right, by, by a flood. And that rainbow is that promise that life will go on. Roy, do you have a question? The ark be cracked in half? After it... Well, Are you thinking of the Ark or the Ark of the Covenant? Okay. Let's talk about that after the service. Okay. But right now, let's pray and uh, thank God for his love. 
Father God, we thank you that you are love and that you give us life. And we thank you for the rainbow, the sign of the promise that life goes on. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's appropriate that we just sang about the Holy Spirit raining down because we're going to read about the rainbow. And you can't have a rainbow 
without a little rain. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 9. I'm going to start reading at verse 8. Of course, this comes at the end of this amazing story, which starts in Genesis chapter 6, 6 through 9. I mean, if you're the type of person that likes disaster movies, you know, those, those movies where everything, the world just blows up, but there's always a few people who survive it. I mean, this is the ultimate disaster movie, the flood. So, uh, but we're reading at the end, we're kind of reading at the, uh, the happy ending part. But Genesis chapter 9, starting in verse 8. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on earth. Amen. Praise God for his word. Well, today is the first day of fall. Okay. The autumnal equinox, as it's also known, where the day and the night are the same length of time. And now... The days just keep getting shorter as we head toward winter. Summer came, and summer went. Seasons come, and seasons go. But one thing we can count on is God's faithfulness. In all the chaos, the confusion, the constant change of life, the one thing we can depend on is that God always keeps his promises. That is what the rainbow covenant is all about. Every time we see a rainbow in the sky, we are reminded that God isn't angry at us. Not like he was angry in Genesis chapter 6, causing him to send the flood. Actually, God wasn't so much angry as he was heartbroken. As we read in Genesis chapter 6, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on earth and his heart was deeply troubled. This is a long way from Genesis chapter 1 after God had created humans and when he saw all that he had made, he said that it was good. And now seeing how far things had fallen broke God's heart. As one theologian wrote, the story is not about the world assaulted in a God who stands remote. It is about the hurt God endures because of and for the sake of his wayward creation. For God so loved the world. So imagine how much it broke God's heart when those who were made in his very image had become 
so corrupt and so wicked. So with a heavy heart, God decided to start over. And thankfully, God found one righteous person, a diamond in the rough. As we read in Genesis chapter 6, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. So God told Noah to build an ark because God was going to flood the earth in order to wipe the slate clean. And in obedience, in obedience to God's command, Noah built the ark. As we read in the Hall of Faith chapter, by faith, Noah, when warned about the things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. We are saved by grace through faith. And through Noah's faith, God would preserve life on earth by providing a shelter in the storm. Now, Mikey, here's the part that, I'm, that I told you I would address in the sermon. Because God actually told Noah to take seven pairs of every kind of clean animal. So in the Old Testament, there was a distinction between clean animals and unclean animals, and you could eat clean animals, but you couldn't eat unclean animals. And God had said, take seven pairs of every kind of clean animal along with seven pairs of every kind of bird and one pair of every kind of unclean animal onto the ark. And that way, Noah and his family could eat some of those clean animals after they got off the ark without wiping out the species. And they could offer uh, a sacrifice to God from the clean animals, again, not wiping out the species. But that was an excellent question. I actually anticipated that you would ask that question this morning. The question was, well, uh, if, if there were two pairs of every kind of animal and then Noah sacrificed one of those animals, whoops, uh, sorry, but there were more than just two pairs. All right, told you I'd cover that. I'll have to talk to Roy later about uh, what, what his question was. But other than Noah and his family, and all the animals on the ark, every human, every animal, every living creature was destroyed in a terrible, cataclysmic, violent flood. Waters erupting from under the ground. Waters pouring down from above for 40 days and 40 nights until every living thing on the earth was wiped out. At the end of Genesis chapter 7, we're told that the waters flooded the earth for 150 days. But then, but then, God remembered Noah. As we read in Genesis chapter 8, but God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark, and he sent a wind over the earth and the waters receded. And as the waters receded, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat, which are located in modern-day Turkey. Eventually, dry ground appeared, and after over a year, over a year of being on the, earth, on the ark, God told Noah that it was time to come out. And the first thing Noah did when he left the ark, other than probably kissing the ground, the first thing that he did was he built an altar, and he sacrificed some of those clean animals and clean birds on it. And this, brothers and sisters, is the heart of worship, thankfulness, gratitude for God's salvation. That's what we do when we come to church on Sunday and sing God's praise. We are like Noah, expressing thankfulness and gratitude for God saving us. And when God smelled the pleasing aroma of Noah's sacrifice, God made a promise. As we read at the end of Genesis chapter 8, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. 
and never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. Back in Genesis chapter 3, God cursed the ground because of Adam and Eve's sin. As God said to Adam, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. Sadly, the earth suffers for the sins of humanity. But after the flood, God had a change of heart. God had a change of heart. Instead of cursing, God made a covenant. Which is interesting. Because even though God's heart changed from one of pronouncing curses to one of making covenants, the human heart didn't change. It wasn't like before the flood, the human heart was corrupt, and then after the flood, the human heart became pure, so, so God made the covenant. No. The human heart was corrupt before the flood, and the human heart continued to be corrupt after the flood. There was no change. The flood couldn't cleanse the human heart. Remember in Genesis chapter 6, God said, the, the, every inclination of their hearts is evil. And then there's this flood, and you'd think maybe there'll be some kind of change. But as God said, never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. One of the doctrines of the Christian Reformed Church is total depravity. Basically, it means humans are sinful. Humans are sinful. Now, the doctrine of total depravity doesn't mean we're as bad as we could be, but it means that everything we humans do is tainted by sin. It means that, that our hearts ha have been corrupted as, as we inherited the tendency to sin, to, to disobey God from Adam and Eve. Sometimes you'll hear people say of someone, oh, he has a good heart. Or, oh, she, she has a, a good heart. How do you know that? See, we, we can't actually know what's going on in someone's heart. We, we can't see their motivation. Sometimes people do good things for bad reasons. And sometimes people do bad things for good reasons. We don't know. Only God knows what takes place in the heart, in our innermost thoughts and desires. In God, he doesn't give the human heart a positive review. No. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter 17, we read this. The heart is deceitful, deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. And even though the human heart continues to be corrupt, God doesn't give us what we deserve. No. God gives us mercy. Before the flood, God cursed the ground because of our sin. But after the flood, God promises never to curse the ground again or destroy all living creatures. As God promised at the end of Genesis chapter 8, as long as the earth endures seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. After the sermon, we're going to sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And one of the verses of that hymn comes from this passage of Scripture. Sure, there's still going to be local floods, but there won't be one that will destroy all living creatures on earth. And, and, and the fact 
that seasons come and seasons go, that daytime always follows the night, the fact that we don't have to worry about a, a worldwide flood destroying all of the life on earth is a sign of God's mercy. The fact that storms don't last forever is a sign of God's mercy. The fact that the sun rises every morning. I've been alive for, for over 56 years, and every single morning that I've been alive, the sun has always risen. And the fact that the sun rises every morning is a sign of God's mercy as the shadows of night vanish. As we read in Lamentations, Lamentations chapter 3, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And that, brothers and sisters, is the gospel. There, right there in Lamentations chapter 3, in a book called Lamentations, about weeping, and, and, and lamenting to God, right there in that book, we see the promise of the gospel as we read in James chapter 2, verse 13, mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. God would much rather be merciful than, than have to pour out his judgment. In the gospel, God says to us, I know you're messed up. I, I, I know that your heart is corrupt. But I still love you, and I will be merciful to you. And as a sign of God's mercy, God put a rainbow in the sky. As God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. This covenant was not only for Noah. It was not only for, for humankind, but it was for the whole world. For God so loved the world. And what a cool sign. What, what, what a cool sign of God's promise. I mean, come on, aren't rainbows cool? Yeah, I think so. I mean, have you ever watched a storm roll in? You know, not just a light rain. I'm talking a thunderstorm. Bam! That's right. I mean, the sky gets black, lightning's flashing across the sky. Our dog Piggy's going crazy, trying to dig herself under the couch. Because she's, so, she's so scared, the wind whipping through the trees. I mean, it's, if you've ever been in, in a thunderstorm, a serious thunderstorm, it can be a frightening experience. But then, then... The storm calms down, blue skies appear again, and if conditions are right, you look up into the sky and you see a rainbow, like a messenger from heaven saying, don't worry, the storm's over, everything is going to be all right. In fact, after a storm, people will often go outside looking for a rainbow. Ever done that? Hey, let's go outside and see if we can find, see a rainbow. Well, I think people do that not just because rainbows are beautiful to look at, but because it's a sign of hope. And in this world of storms and chaos and pain and suffering, things that, that threaten to destroy us, we need the hope that everything is going to be all right and life will go on. And God, in his mercy, has given us a sign of that hope, the rainbow. Do you know what a rainbow baby is? You ever heard that term? A rainbow baby? Some of you know what that is. Some of you have a rainbow baby. A rainbow baby is what they call a baby who is born after a woman has, has suffered a pregnancy loss. 
such as a, a miscarriage. And the reason they call the baby that's born after that pregnancy loss, the reason they call that baby a rainbow baby is because that baby is a sign that life goes on. After the, the heartbreak, the sorrow, the storm of a pregnancy loss where, where a, a flood washes away your dreams, the rainbow baby brings the joy of new life, a joy that we get to experience because, because God is faithful to keep his promises. The reason that God preserved Noah's life was to preserve his promise to send the Savior. The ark resting on the mountains of Ararat pointed to another means of salvation found on Mount Calvary, the cross. And just like, that the, just like the only people who survived the flood, the only people who were saved from the flood were the people on the ark, it's only the people who believe in Jesus Christ who will be saved from God's wrath against sin on the judgment day. And that's the day that was, Mikey, were you talking about? I think you picked up on God will never destroy the, the earth by a flood, but by fire. We read about that in 1 Peter, 1st uh, uh, or 2nd Peter, where it talks about judgment day. But the people who trust in Jesus Christ, just like Noah and his family and all those animals who got on the ark and were saved from the flood, the people who trust in Jesus Christ will be saved on God's judgment day. When God smelled the aroma of the sacrifice that Noah offered, he looked ahead. He looked ahead to the one perfect sacrifice that Jesus Christ would offer, putting an end to the need for any other animal sacrifices. And when God smelled Noah's sacrifice, he, he, he saw that that day when Jesus Christ would offer his life on the cross and that God would purify our hearts by the blood of his own son, Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. The flood couldn't cleanse the human heart, but the blood of Jesus Christ can. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus and when God smelled that pleasing aroma of Noah's sacrifice, he thought of the day when Jesus would usher in the new creation and, and, and where God would, would wipe away all the tears from our eyes because there will be no more death or suffering or, or, or pain or grief. As, as heaven comes down to earth, and on that day, the earth will be filled with God's shalom. Life will go on. And that rainbow, that rainbow is a promise that life will go on. The Hebrew word that's translated rainbow in Genesis chapter 9, it's not rainbow. It's actually a word for a war bow, the kind that you, you shoot arrows. And by setting his bow in the clouds, God was hanging up his weapon. As if to say, I'm done fighting with you. E even though you still act like my enemy. Even though you still rebel against me and, and disobey my commandments, I, I'm, I'm tired of fighting against you. No more floods. From now on, from now on, I offer you life. And that is exactly what we get through faith in Jesus Christ. Eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. 
That's a promise. And God never fails to keep his promises. So the next time you look up in the sky and see a rainbow, thank God for his mercy. And thank God for Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are the God of life, not the God of death. Lord, we thank you that mercy triumphs over judgment, and you would much, much rather pour out your mercy on us than your judgment. And the fact that you sent Jesus Christ to die for our sins and then rise again to new life is a sign, is a sign that mercy triumphs over judgment. Lord, help us to trust you, to trust you, to look to you for mercy, for grace, and for life. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand in body or spirit as we sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
And our faithful God is the God who blesses you. Receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.